Uh, so welcome to today's webinar when we are having a deeper look into frontier markets investing. Uh, we're going to have a Q&A function open throughout the webinar and I encourage everyone to post your questions there, uh, which will later be addressed towards the end of these 30 minutes. Uh, my name is Hannah, for those of you who haven't met me before, uh, and I'm working here uh, in the investor relations team at East Capital. Um, I've invited Sanat Sachar uh, from the investment team, who's a senior analyst and who has been investing into frontier markets for ver over various uh, economic cycles. Welcome, Sanat. Thank you, Hannah. So uh, you've quite recently come back from uh, a trip to uh, Philippines where you were visiting uh, companies, uh, portfolio companies and, uh, and also new companies. Do you have any impressions that you'd like to share just to start off? Sure, it was a very good experience. So this is after almost one and a half year when I was able to travel to these companies and these countries. So it was more like I would say business as usual going back to normal for us because that's the kind of investment process we follow. We like to see these companies and have this first hand experience. I think that's where the real experience happened that I was able to travel to these countries, speak to the management and more than that, have this first hand experience of the economy, seeing the traffic on the road, how people are traveling, how is the situation there. But I think that's the kind of feel we want to have before we want to invest in these kind of companies. Thank you, Sanat. Um, I think emerging markets has become very much a, a standard allocation for most in institutions these days, uh, but we're here to, to speak about frontier markets. And I think as a starting point, why don't we just you know, go through what is a frontier market? Um, how do you define them? Sure, thank you very much for this question. So just to understand, Okay, if you look at my slides, so there's a classic definition of how we define a MSCI by, by the emerging markets by MSCI. And then we have a classic definition of frontier markets by MSCI. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the emerging markets, so we have broken it down into three sections, block A, block B, and block C. In block A, there are five major countries. That's China, uh, Taiwan, South Korea, and Brazil and India. These are large emerging markets which contribute around 78% of the MSCI EM index. Then we have Block B, which is basically the sixth country which contribute around 16%. So let's say the majority of the EM investors focus is on these two big markets. But when you go to Block C, these are 13 markets, 13 economies, which contribute around 7% to the entire emerging market index. And that's approximately less than half a percent. So for a classic emerging market manager, these markets are very much irrelevant because this doesn't change anything in their life. If they focus on their first two sections, that just solves the problem. And this is where the opportunity comes for a very alpha focused bottom of managers like us. So the way we define our frontier markets is this classic frontier market index, which is around 120 countries plus, plus these block C and some part of block B. And why these we, we call them the three, four under. These are underrepresented markets in this respective benchmark. That's why they are under research and they are undervalued. And that's where they give a lot of good opportunities where you can buy these great companies that have very reasonable valuations. So you're mentioning that you know, they are under researched, great opportunities for um, alpha uh, investors like ourselves. Uh, but are there any other arguments? You know, why should investors consider frontier markets if they have developed and frontier in their books already? Why adding? Frontier markets to that. Sure. Uh, yeah. If you look at this chart, so this is what economic uh, uh, World Bank data. So this frontier emerging market, what we are talking about, they're expected to grow at around 4.4 percent for GDP for next four years. If you compare it with the classic emerging markets, they're growing at three and a half percent, and the developed markets at 1.8 percent. So there are two ways I can see you can look at these markets. So either you can say they are growing at two percentage points higher than the developed markets, or let's say 100 percent higher growth because it's 1.8 to 4.4. And even in this section, I would say you have to break it down these specific markets. So yes, there are some markets which are growing at a slower pace, like Sri Lanka and these ones. But when you talk about the countries on the left side, that's like Bangladesh, Vietnam, Philippines, these markets have been growing at around six or seven percent for the last many years. And they are expected to grow at this rate because of the structural growth reasons and they are coming from very low base. So this kind of growth is expected to continue for many more years. Another argument I have is the biggest question which we already received from investors is yes, 
they are great growing GDP growth markets, but as an equity investor, can you get exposed to this kind of growth? And the answer is yes. So this is the kind of strategy which we run. So th this is our biggest anchor for the for our investment is the earning growth. So we have been earning they have been earning growth of around 14 to 15 percent in these markets for every year. And mind it, this is not CAGR kind of growth that you have one year, you have massive growth, and then after that you don't have anything. This is structural growth which is happening year after year after year, and that's the kind of track record we have. Yes, there was a drop in 2020 because of the whole COVID situation, but now things are going back to normal. Last year we saw 32 percent earnings growth. This year, 20% and then things will go back to normal at 15%. So the idea is this all the investment case is anchored towards the earning growth. And yes, this GDP growth is being translated to earning growth, which will be translated to the price increase, which we are which we are after. But what about you know volatility? I think there's a general impression that emerging markets are more volatile than the developed markets and then frontier markets is going to be even more volatile than the frontier. So the frontier market is going to be more volatile than the emerging markets. Can you maybe uh, talk us through uh, this phenomenon? Sure. Thank you for this question. Actually, I would say because this is a big misconception about these markets. So if if you just think about Bangladesh or Pakistan in standalone basis, this will not give you a very amusing feeling. And yes, these markets are a little more volatile than the classic emerging markets. But the beauty of this product is. When you bring them all together in one portfolio context, the volatility goes down significantly. And to your surprise, I would say uh, the volatility of frontier markets as a group is much lower than the developed markets and the emerging markets. And the question is, why is the reason? Is it like a mathematical gimmick that we create some numbers and put something together and the volatility is low? No, there are very structural reasons to that. For example, if you look at developed markets, so developed markets are largely to do with US and Europe. But these markets are very much interlinked to each other. So if something happens in US, the Europe is definitely impacted because there are a lot of trade relations. They're doing a lot of trade with each other, a lot of movement of people and everything. Same thing with emerging markets. I showed you the emerging market index. So let's say this, I we call it cats. So China, Taiwan, South Korea, this is like a one big block. This is around 60% of the index, which, which works in a very similar fashion. They are very close ties by business, by the economic factors. But when you come to frontier markets, there is no one factor which determines the whole story. For example, let's say the oil price. Mm. Oil price is a big mover in these days, and this is impacting the developed market and emerging markets. But what's the impact of oil price on frontier markets? So on one hand, we have Philippines, which is an oil importer. And yes, definitely they're facing some challenges for, because the oil price is going up. But on the other hand, we have Saudi Arabia, which is an oil exporter, and they are getting much, much, much higher benefit because of this higher oil price. So that's how these are the balancing act. And if you just put it in a different context, so for we have Bangladesh, which has nothing to do with uh, Nigeria, and Nigeria has nothing to do with Iceland, and Iceland don't even know where is Pakistan. So I think that's the kind of diversification you have in these markets. There's no one factor which determines everything. And everybody has a very independent economic cycles. There are very limited trade, uh, by trade, uh, trade between these kind of countries, and that gives this natural diversification to the portfolio, which brings the whole volatility down. So, how should uh, investors then think about this asset class in a portfolio context? What role does it play? Sure. So there are two ways. This is how we tell our investors to look at these markets. One is you look at the frontier market as a standalone asset class. And second thing is maybe if you are not very familiar with the frontier market, then you the way you can look at it, you can look at it as a part of your broader emerging market bucket. So the one I'm showing you on the screen now is it's we created a 70-30 kind of bucket. Let's say 70% is the classic emerging market, MSCI EM, and then 30% bring frontier markets to your part of the emerging market bucket. And the result which we have seen is you generate an excess return by having this 70-30 kind of portfolio over a classic emerging market index, but the most importantly is on the standard deviation. So you generate 20% lower standard deviation if you have this kind of portfolio rather than a classic emerging market portfolio, and which in turn results in a much higher sharp ratio. I think for a for an asset allocator kind of investor, this is something which they want to generate. They want to generate a similar or slightly higher return, but at a lower volatility, which will improve the overall sharp ratio. So I think that's Another way of looking at things which we suggest investors to look at it in this fashion also. Yeah. But um, 
you know me well enough to to know that I I can't avoid talking about ESG uh, and especially when it comes to emerging and frontier markets investing. Um, this is a top priority for many institutions out there. So can you maybe comment on how do you approach that in these markets? I mean, performance profile looks great, a diversification benefits. How about ESG? Uh, what's the level of ESG awareness? How do you approach it when investing in these markets? Sure. So I don't say that ESG is one of the step in our investment process because this is part of the every step which we have in the investment mm -hmm. process. So this is not like at the start of the, the process, I look at ESG or at the end of the day. I see ESG at every step of the process. We have our own objective ways of looking at the ESG profile to start with. Let's say we have an ESG scorecard, mm -hmm. which is a very objective way where we see how the companies score on a specific ESG score. But the idea is, is this the end of the story? Not really. So the way we look at ESG scorecard, it's like an entrance test. Mm -hmm. So does the company qualify to be part of the portfolio or no? But the whole story starts after the company is there and then when you pass the entrance exam. And the whole story is all about the engagement, engagement and engagement. Yeah. So the whole idea is we want to work with the company. So when we invest in a company, we are not just buying the stocks. Yeah. We are a part owner in the company and that ownership comes with a great responsibility. So whenever we invest in a company, we, we call them and we just explain about us, who we are, what we have done and what we can, we can do. But the idea is one question we always ask him. Yes, we expect something from you as, as a company which you're investing in. But what can we do as a shareholder? How can we add value to the system? And it's all about collaboration. Yeah. We, we, we bring some kind of expertise with us because we have been investing in these markets, different markets, during different economic cycle. We have worked extensively worked on ESG, but these some of these companies are not very, let's say, uh, familiar with this ESG concept. So this is where we can add really value to the system. Yeah. Maybe I can give you one example. So, yes, please. Uh, I was just before this pandemic started. I was in in December 2019. I was in Bangladesh and I was speaking to one of the company and I realized this is a very good company and this is this, this fits a lot in our investment thesis. Mm. But there are a few things which we really need to work with them and collaborate with them. And then we figure out there are some fundamental things which you want to work. But on top of that, where we can add value to these companies, how can we be some support to this company? And we realized there are a couple of ESG metrics which they, they were not really created or they were actually doing it, but they were not formulating it in a proper fashion the, the way the, the uh, uh, proper European exper uh, investor would like to see. So then we work, started working with them. We worked on the more some of the ESG initiative they wanted to work. And then we said, OK, that's one part of the equation, but the biggest issue which we see is there's no visibility by this kind of company but among various investors. And then we use our network. We, we talk to one few brokers and we told them that why don't you start covering them? Why don't you invite to these companies to one of your conferences? And that's the kind of value that we bring to the system. Mm -hmm. And then we see the kind of results which we have. So again, ESG is one step is like an entrance test, but then the work starts and that work doesn't happen couple of days, a couple of weeks. It's a it's a lot of hard work which goes for a couple of quarters. We monitor them. We try to engage with them. We'll collaborate with them. We share our information with them. We share our experiences with them. And then the value become clear and then, then the value crystallizes, and that is reflected into the share price. And that's the whole process of ESG for us. What's the typical kind of holding period for a company then? Yes. So holding period, I would say uh, we are very, very long term investors. So for us, the holding period is, is forever. Yeah. We, we are a very long term investor. So as I mentioned, so we, we want to work with these companies and we don't want to just buy today, sell tomorrow. We keep on working with them. And again, the whole idea is the investment thesis. If we believe sometimes it happens that we are working with the company and we believe that we started with some kind of specific criteria that we want to achieve by the end of this, let's say some timelines. And if these are not being achieved or we have the company is not responding in the right fashion or the way we want them, then only we exit. Otherwise, we want to hold with this company. We want to work with them and create value continuously forever. Sounds uh, like the way to approach companies when you kind of want to work with them and, and, and achieve something. Um, I um, I have some some questions that are coming in uh, now and I continue to encourage everyone to to uh, post your questions in the in the Q&A channel. Um, so uh, one question is, um, I believe that a common perception about the frontier markets are that they're not very liquid. Can you please discuss the liquidity profile of these markets? Sure. 
So if you compare these markets, definitely they are not as liquid as the, the large emerging markets of China and in India, but these markets have come a long way from where we have started from last three to five years. So I think in last three to five years, we have seen an immense growth in terms of participation by a lot of foreign investors. So for example, in our strategy, we only look at company which is more than $200,000 of their liquidity, mm -hmm. and we come up with a universe of around 1,000 companies. So that's good enough for you to have a very decent portfolio investment horizon. Again, just to put things in perspective, uh, for example, we have a big exposure to Vietnam, and that's the that's a big classic in frontier markets. That market trades at around a billion dollars a day. Mm -hmm. Then we have Saudi, which is also a very decent market for us. Mm -hmm. That market trades around 2.3 billion dollars a day. And was it if you look at Hong Kong or Singapore, that trades at 700 million dollars a day. So that's the kind of put profile we have been seeing in last three to four years. That's been growing consistently because of more people coming to the market, becoming more understanding of this value these companies can offer. So mm -hmm. the liquidity profile is improving. And I think I would say it's very good enough to have a very clear investment process and have a very proper portfolio where you can invest in a lot of companies and have decent diversification. Thank you, Sanat. Um, here's another one. Um, which particular frontier market countries are best placed to perform in today's volatile market environment? Sure. Uh, and why? So, okay, uh, it's a, it's a two part of the, the, to this answer. Uh, so the way I, we see, we are we are we are not very focused on the countries. We are very stock picker. So the way we look at companies is that company investors, not country investors, and we look at every company in a bottom of fashion. But if you still want me to put two numbers, let's say the one country which we really like at this point in time, and one country which we try to stay away is maybe I'll talk about the first. The stay away is. Uh, we are very, very focused on the liquidity. The whole idea of we are running a liquid asset class, so we should be able to enter and exit the country. So, for example, as I mentioned, that Sri Lanka is one of the parts. How much investment we have in Sri Lanka? We, we foresee that this is kind of things which we can have in Sri Lanka. They could suffer from. Mm -hmm. We have zero investments in Sri Lanka. Okay. Nigeria is another in, in country in, in our investment year which is facing some challenges, I think. And we have lost, let's say, on paper, we have lost a lot of alpha because of this, because these markets are closed and no investors can bring take take out dollars from the country. Yeah. So everybody's investing in the market. So yes, you, if you are investing in the market, you can make a lot of paper money. But is it really this is the money you can really take out from the country? Not really. And we don't want to have that kind of situation the way we are stuck. So we foresee again this kind of situation. We exited the market almost two years back, but that doesn't mean we'll never go back to these countries. We are we are ready with the kind of companies which we want to invest in. These are still good companies in a little bit volatile market situation and when the market improves, we'll go back. But let's say liquidity and ability to enter and exit is the most important one. We don't want to be stuck. We don't want to create a paper money for the one. It should be really real value add to the investors. So that's the kind of investments or country we want to stay away at this point in time. And on the other side, the country which we really like yeah, at this point of time is Middle East. I think this is a very promising economic environment for them. The oil is at 120. They are making a lot of money and this money has been used in the right purposes. So earlier we have seen that this sometimes this money is being used for things which the countries don't really require. But now this money is being channeled to the right kind of investment, which will help them these countries to grow their uh, GDP for multiple years at the structural rate. And I think that's why we like Saudi Arabia is one of the, one of the top uh, exposure for us at this point in time. So Saudi Arabia is um, very much associated with oil, of course, and fossil fuels. Um, is that a, something you would invest in? Sure. OK, uh, we are very, very ESG focused, as I mentioned. So we have zero exposure to fossil fuels and we will never invest in fossil fuel. But the whole idea is we don't want to we don't directly invest in this. But this because of this, as I mentioned, these countries are taking this money from this fossil fuel. Yeah. It's something like a Norway example. You make money out of the fossil fuel, but you invest in the right kind of sectors. The, so we, the kind of exposure we have in Saudi Arabia is electronics retailer, the IT company, the, the food and beverage company. And I think that's the kind of exposure we like to have, which will have a spillover effect of this higher oil price and better economic environment, which will go to the real economy where the re, the life of the re, normal common people is getting impacted and they are having a better life tomorrow. Yeah. Are there any other aspects of frontier markets that investors should be aware of or, you know, have in mind when, when investing into this asset class? Sure. I think I would say uh, the way we look at the, these markets is these are structural growing markets. So mm -hmm. we should not be 
trying to time these markets. I don't like to time these markets because these are very structural growing markets which are growing because of very domestic reasons where people are becoming much more wealthy. They are going to buy this more food. Um, they are using fintech payments. They're buying more cars. And that's the kind of structure we have these markets which are growing at a profitable rate. But due to current market volatility, the, the market has gone down. So currently they're trading at a PE of 9.8.8%. That's the latest number. And this is only the third time in history we have seen this kind of uh, multiples in these markets. Wow. But again, the idea is we are not betting on the multiple expansion. The, again, the investment thesis is very much anchored on the earnings growth. These companies will be growing their earnings by 14 to 15 percent, and that should be reflected in the price. Mm -hmm. And if these multiples go back to the five year average, which are around, around 11.8 to 12, then you see this kind of, let's say, kicker in these markets. So I think that's the way you should be looking at these markets. Structural growth reasons because of very domestic reasons, nothing to do with one specific aspect or one specific event which can change the whole story. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Um, I um, have no further questions coming in from the audience. Um, I think it's been uh, extremely interesting, um, very helpful to see these markets in a portfolio context as well and see how it can definitely um, benefit the overall performance of your kind of EM bucket when blending frontier markets uh, into them. Um, if you as, a, as an um, attendee uh, of this webinar uh, would like to uh, speak to us about frontier markets investing, feel free to reach out to myself uh, or one of my colleagues on the investor relations team. We are also available in the social media channels uh, over mail um, and over the phone. Uh, so I'm going to wrap up now and say thank you everyone who has uh, listened in today and hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.